And we are live, Christian Jack, alongside Gareth Wheeler and Oliver Platt after the result in Nashville ends. United States won, Canada won in World Cup qualifying. Great to be with everybody here. Come on in, join us on a Sunday night. What have you got to go to bed for? It's Labor Day. We're all pumped after watching the game. And uh, wheels up. Ollie Platt's here. We're going to break it down and we're going to get your questions and comments in as well uh, for the night. We're live on YouTube channels, on the Canadian Premier League news, uh, YouTube channel and, of course, on One Soccer. This is the perfect marriage between our couples here and uh, we will break it down with you for <laughs> some time. Wheels, you've got a big smile on your face as ever. Uh, I always love that about you. But this, uh, as a, from a Canadian point of view, and please leave your comments and questions. We're going to get some. This was a very deserved point for Canada. Your thoughts? And you are muted, my friend. Just uh, unmute. Uh, un un unmute yourself. There you go. Off to a flyer. There he is. I'm, I'm new to the stream yard stream. Uh, I, I love know. the marriage uh, comment because we're all madly in love. And how can you not love that performance tonight by the Canadian men's national team? Uh, that's three to four games and, and arguably four to four games against the United States where Canada's been right in the game, looked very much the part and could have come away with more than what they got in three of those four games. I just thought tonight was a professional approach. There was some rotation, keeping in mind that this is a three-game window. It's very difficult. Um, the United States, they caused, Canada caused problems. And I'm not sure if they got a proper read on how Canada wants to play or the way that they're changing within games and how to actually go on and deal with it. And uh, my main takeaway, Cage, it will be character. <laughs> I mean, going down a goal away from home against the best team in CONCACAF. That's what the United States are. Some people might not feel that way, but this is the team that just crushed Mexico all summer long. And all the big dogs have come back into the team, minus a couple. I'm sure we're going to get to that in a little bit later on. But going down a goal, uh, it could have gone sideways, but the response was there. And it wasn't just the way that they went on and scored that goal, KJ. In the buildup to that goal, the United States were applying all kinds of pressure. And players like Daniel Henry, Alistair Johnston, Kamal, Kamal Miller coming onto the field. They just get, grab the game by the scruff of the neck and they refuse to quit. I just love that mentality. And it's just about the game tonight. I think that that bodes well over the course of the next 12 games coming up that this team looks tactically proficient. But it's the dedication, the commitment, KJ, that kind of makes it all work and takes it to, an, uh, takes it to another level. Yeah, all great points. A night where many players clearly belonged, if anybody doubted them. A night when they showed they really belong against the CONCACAF elite. Uh, we're taking your questions, your comments. We're reading them all here. We'll bring some up as the night goes on. Uh, Charlie O'Connor Clark, my report on Canadian Premier League uh, website, will be listening to the post-match press conferences of Greg Berhalter, of John Herdman, and the players. Well, he will join us shortly to give his take from the press conferences as well. Ollie, your overall thoughts on what was a big night for Canadian football? Um, on a scale of one to ten, how do we rate the coming U.S. meltdown? <laughs> it's be there. It's gonna, they they it's called be it a must-win. They called it a yeah. must-win. Second game of the World Cup qualifiers. They got booed <laughs> off the pitch. Booed off the That's pitch. What I mean, you gotta love it, right? In Injected into the veins of all Canadian fans. I'm gonna be interested to see that reaction, but but yeah, I just echo what we all said. Really, I thought it was a really good performance. Um, I thought. Besides maybe five minutes in either half where the game got a bit chaotic, they, they looked really in control, really comfortable in their defensive shape. The U.S. didn't really look like they had many solutions um, to what Canada was, was presenting them with. And I think the only regret is, is that could have been three points. Um, if you can go on and beat El Salvador now and come out with five and have taken two off the U.S. in a home game for them, then I think you're pretty happy. So I'm not going to get, you know, I'm not going to complain about that too much, but you look at some of the chances that they had, some of the balls that flashed across the six-yard box when Sejan Buchanan came on later in the game. That could have been a win for Canada, um, and, and that reflects really well on the performance as a whole, I think. Yeah, the balls that come across, you mentioned it was three in particular in the second yeah. half. One from Junior, Junior Hoyler in the 50th minute, another one from Buchanan, and then one from Lorea very late, all of which you just need a gambler. You just need somebody yeah. to just get on the end yeah. of it right there. Uh, we're not complaining. They got a point one one, but at that point, you could see that the Americans were a little bit jittery. Uh, Jonathan says we rotate the squad a bit and still got a point. He seems very happy. Uh, Jeffrey asks who was the man of the match, uh, particularly for the United States men's national team. I think Tyler Adams was probably their best player by a country mile um but you know the uh <laughs> the, the, 
the, let's just say the breakdown of the United States tonight will not be happening here. One, because this is our, you know, we're, we're talking about Canada. And two, I think there's going to be enough people talking about their problems. <laughs> the uh, you know, all I'll say is a uh, decent point for the United States, considering they play with 10 men without a striker for the entire match. Because everyone talks about Canada's problems with the defense. They've got nobody who can play as a right. number nine in that team. Uh, you know, no, nobody at that moment. Uh, great shout out from Daniel on Adekubi as the man of the match. What a terrific yeah. performance by Samuel Adekubi. A lot of people yeah. will talk about Alfonso Davies. We'll get to that in a minute, Ollie. But John Herbin found a system tonight. He started with a 3-5-2, went to a 4-4-2, went back to the three at different times, or a five, as you want to call it, where Adekubi and Davies were asked to play a part. And that Sam Adekubi's come into this in great club form. And you can see, again, another example of a player who is just going to another level as soon as he gets his opportunity. The standards and levels have been set, Ollie, in this team by others. The moment somebody else comes in, they have to match it and go on and, and improve. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think one of the great strengths of this team is the flexibility, right? And you see that in players like Adekubi and Morea and Johnston, the way they're able to kind of slide up and down the lineup, whether it's playing, you know, as an outside centre-back in, in Johnston's case or a full-back or playing as a full-back or a wing-back or even a wide midfielder they have that ability to, to make those in-game changes very easily. Um, I actually thought the in-game changes maybe didn't work as well as they would have wanted to tonight. I, I thought they looked much better when they were five at the back and a little bit uncomfortable when they went to the 4-4-2, which I think they wanted to do to try and maybe, you know, be a bit more aggressive, create a bit more, but I don't think it necessarily helps them that much tonight. But having that ability to, to switch is obviously very useful. Um, and Davies and Adekubi, like, they've played together for a long time, right? They've known, known each other for a long time. Um, there's that familiarity there, and it was it was an outstanding goal that they both obviously played a key part. In. Mike Newell says this U.S. team is beatable. I think we've seen and we've done a lot of interviews with these players. Yeah. We know these players. We saw right from the start that Canada kicked off and they felt like they could win this game tonight. And that's a wow. belief. Again, the end, the level of belief in this team, there's a difference between hoping it goes your way and believing it will. And that was, that's the difference in this Canadian team tonight. And right from the start, I felt like that they could definitely feel like that was the case. And, you know, the, as we said, time and time again, people will talk about the problems of the U.S. team, but they were, there's nothing on that pitch tonight that, they can, that, that Canada should fear with the U.S. Yes, they've got UEFA Champions League winner in Christian Pulisic. Yes, Adams is a really good player. Uh, they've got some really nice players in there. Robinson played well, Miles Robinson. But Wheels, this is, the, this is a team that is very beatable if Canada plays them at home and a team we shouldn't be feared. Well, it was a team that was unbeatable during the summer, and yeah. it was predominantly made up of domestic players. I, I think that it raised, and I talked to a lot of people about this, it raised some eyebrows that we brought back so many players who play overseas, right. and a lot of them are unestablished in the team. Like, I'm not sure why Bearhalter would have gone away from what worked so well over the course of the summer months, and... I know it's two games in, but you, you know how the American media works. They're going to be all over Greg Bearhalter. Uh, I want to add on a comment about Ollie, uh, that, about what Ollie mentioned about changing formations. I, I, it might not work in that moment, you know, the switch from the 3-5-2 or, 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 or the 3-4-3 three, three to a 4-4-2, four, four, but you're keeping the other team guessing, right? Like, you got to keep the big picture in mind that you might be willing to sacrifice five minutes to take a little bit of a risk, pull the dice, give the team a different look. I just, having spoken about his style of play so often with John Herman, I just think that that's part of his game plan. 15-minute segments of games, perhaps 20-minute segments of games, where you kind of see how that plays out, you switch a look, you go back, you adjust, you keep the other team guessing. Like, I don't think the team could have survived tonight just sitting back and playing I agree with that 3-4-3 three, four, th three, four, three, the entire night, even though it worked well over the first 25 minutes. You need to be able to show that you can be a threat in different ways. And and I think it's a microcosm of how he's approaching this, you know, 14-match world, world qualifying campaign that – it's it's a marathon. It's it's not a sprint. So I think it's going to be a measured approach. I think that fans are going to have to maybe adjust their expectations to deal with that a little bit. Because at the end of the day, KJ, what was the number you came up with? You, you think it's twenty two points to go on and qualify? Yeah, I, I think it's around twenty four points. Yeah, needless I think to eight, say, low I think 18, 18, right? Twenty three. I think eighteen to twenty three can get wow, it. Wow, eighteen. Yeah. You think so? Well, uh, well, well based on how things have started, right? So, well, the team who finished third last time, Panama, got one point three points per game. So. Right. That's, you know, I mean, that right there, we're seeing already how hard it is to win in the CONCACAF World Cup qualifying yeah. stages, right? Yeah. 
By the way, away away wins are really rare. We've got two of them today. We only had four in the last time out of 30 games, two in the Crazy. same day. You know, Jamaica got, if anyone's missed it, Jamaica got pounded today at home uh, by Panama. Not many people saw that coming, lost 3-0. That's why games like this, even though they could be wins, they feel like wins. You go to a place like the United yeah. States and you draw a game like that, and you could bet you could write 14 games down on the on the board and you could rank them. The United States away is either going to be one or it's going to be two. How hard it is, right? Out of the 14 for Canada. It is. So, you know, yeah. you go out there and you get that point today. Okay, you, people think they've left two at home against Honduras. I'll, I'll take that argument, but they've got one back tonight. They've got yeah. one back mm -hmm. out of the, out of all that. You mentioned it, Wheels. That Jonathan Penny asks, break down the 3-5-2 to 4-4-2. Lots of arguments of why the 4-4-2 worked, um, so it didn't work. Lots of people say 3-5-2 was their preference. I, I agree with you, Gareth. One thing I would say is, for me, the 4-4-2, it brings energy and pressing, and it engages Hoylert, and it engaged Laren, right? That's the thing. If you if you sit deeper, they're not engaged enough, and they pressed, and they engaged, and I think it kind of got Laren going a little bit. Now, you know, Laren can be a bit languid, and I'm going to use L and L. It sometimes can be a little bit languid in game. Sometimes you watch him, and you think, oh, that shot in the first half was a bit of a side pa back pass, you know? Get some energy behind you. Go and, and gamble like David would. But he's Johnny on the spot when he scored, you know, and he gets, he, he doesn't disappear in games, Ollie. And that pressing, I think, engages the front line. And then they went back and they showed that tactical versatility. So sometimes you've got to show, as, as, as we all said, different looks to opponents. And I think it can engage players at different times, Ollie. Yeah, I, I disagree with you guys a little bit on this one, I think, because I, I, I don't mind them going to the 4 4 2 because it was the same thing they did against Mexico, right? They start in the back five, they go to the 4 4 2 later on, it gives them more up front. So I, I have no I, no problem with them um, following that same kind of model again. Right. For, for me, it didn't it didn't work tonight to go to the 4 4 2. I thought that those were the worst periods of the game for Canada by far. And I actually disagree a bit that they couldn't have survived in, in the 5 4 1. I thought they looked totally comfortable in that shape all night long. Um, and, and the US really, really struggled to break them down a little bit. So I, I get what you're saying in terms of switching up. I don't necessarily have a problem with them trying the formation change in the game because they're trying to get something going, show them a different look. I get that. I, I just didn't think it necessarily came off tonight. I thought they looked completely comfortable when they're in that 5 four, one and that was when they had the, most of their best moments. What about Alfonso Davies tonight? There's a moment where in the second half, he obviously gets a little bit injured and we'll have to find out if he's going to play Wednesday. That will be a big question mark now. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at that point, the US crowd didn't really know he was injured and they just start pounding this guy with pelters and verbal abuse and booing him. And I'm like, we've arrived here. Boys, this is this this is this, this is fine. As is, as as yeah, Canadians master the dark arts of Kankakov is incredible. Now it wasn't a master because yeah. he was hurt, but he did make sure he went back on the pitch wheels. And you know we're getting a little, yeah. we're seeing this team getting a bit smarter in these moments. It, it it's intelligent and it's planned. I, I know what happened with Max Propo uh, going down. What, was it the Mexico game as yeah, well? Yeah, the twenty Borean minutes in. Today as well to start the new did the, the exact same too. thing. Yeah, I, it was funny when that happened because I just rewound it back. I'm like, he he didn't touch the ball like for like seven minutes before that. So you knew exactly what was going on at that moment, but it just allowed him to readjust and look. It was a mature performance. This team is maturing before our eyes. They're composed. There's no pack. Remember, these are players that have played in big games. These are players that have gone on to win league titles, win MLS Cups, uh, gone on to do special things in big competitions, and they don't look phased at all. And this is part of it, the understanding that um, – Look, it's not even just in this region. You just need to be intelligent about how you manage the game. And tonight, they managed the game. Uh, I think for long stretches, they took what was available for them, which is a sign of maturity. I didn't try to force the issue. And at the end of the game, when it looked like a point was good enough to take, then that's what they set out to do. And they still were able to create the, the better chances there at the end of the game uh, as well, just uh, just being a little bit more measured. So uh, again, that's another really positive sign for this team. Like I can't re I how many times have we watched the Canadian men's national team in the past and there's like panic and, and just like th th there's like a lack of trust in one another. This team clearly trusts in one another. They're communicating on the field and it's coming across as being one that's just very confident in its approach.
Full time in Nashville, United States won, Me- uh, Canada won, Mexico got the win earlier. It is tough to win in CONCACAF. Canada back to back draws to start their CONCACAF World Cup qualifying si- uh, situation. Uh, what adjustments helped us contain Pulisic in the second half? It was lively starting into tight spaces and keeping our back line on edge in the first they half. They kicked the crap out of him, honestly. They didn't back- <laughs> they How really many did. times was Pulisic down on the field? By the way, it? Alistair Johnston, and big thanks to the referee. Oh. Uh, because the ref had a great night. He has to be said. He was a really good ref, I thought. Uh, Alistair Johnson could got away with maybe a couple of yellow cards, but again, uh, defended really well against the UEFA Champions League winner. I'll tell you what I liked about tonight. I've long been an admirer of US soccer. Um, I'm an, an, uh, By the way, I'm an enormous fan of Weston McKinney, and when he didn't play tonight, I had a smile on my face straight away. I was no like, kidding. what is going on here? Because McKinney is the engine. He's the driver of that team. He's young, uh, but he plays like an old guy who just drives teams forward. He is that alpha guy in that who will, who will push players forward and be that, that, that engine. Adams played that right tonight, but as I said, I've been a long admirer of this team for a long time. Obviously, Pulisic speaks for himself. Love Adams from when he was 17, 18 and saw him and worked on his games when he was at Red Bulls. Aronson, another brilliant young player and, and delivered with his goal tonight. There's a lot of young players there that I admire. But tonight, I found myself thinking, we as a nation, Canada's got players like that now. You know, the, yeah. If you're an American, if you're American player, if you're an American fan or a broadcaster who's leaving Nashville right now and you can take off your blinders a minute, you're going away going, that's some team, by the way. That's the, if you if you think outside how those teams are starting to talk about Canada and the way Estacchio and Kay played and Buchanan comes on and was a difference maker. Jonathan David didn't even start the match. Alfonso Davis just another level, by the way, just far better than anybody else on the pitch, Ollie. But you know we can always analyze Canada as being a nation that we're looking to. But from an outside, the impressions of if you're a real sensible fan are very very different the way they're looking at this team, and they should be. Yeah, there, there were real matchup problems, I thought, for the US in, in a couple of different places, but particularly with Davies, right? Like, you would have ordinarily thought, I think, like we saw in 2019 in the game at BMO Field, that Davies might go up front or play through the middle a bit more and have that kind of freer role. Um, he didn't because he had Dest and Yedlin on toast all night. Like, they're, they're, either one of them, they're, they're both decent going forwards, I think, obviously, particularly Dest, but they can't really defend. And and that matchup between Davies and, and, and Dest and then Yedlin was was just giving Canada joy all night long. So you, you, you start to think about, you know, I think not just a right back, but the youth at both fullback positions for the United States, the ability, we saw what Buchanan did when he came on as well. Um, David, Laren, obviously, like the, the, there's players in this Canadian team that I don't think they have answers to. And, and I think that, that probably played a part in inhibiting them going forwards a little bit because they were concerned looking over their shoulder about what was going to come the other way, you know, with a bad turnover or if an attack broke down. Um, so in, in, in a way, I think, you know, it bodes well for Canada going to Mexico, going to some of the tougher games in this qualification period. Um, they have such a big threat on the counterattack that they can sit deep and, and teams, I think, will be really worried about what's coming the other way. Yeah, it's a good point about counterattack because I found myself thinking that as well. When you break down Canada, we know, particularly in all the games we've done on one soccer, particularly against inferior opposition in CONCACAF, that they've run, they've run up the, you know, the, the records, right? Wheels talks about it all the time yeah. in commentary, record number of goals. And what do we always hear from the coaching staff say? Even when they're not playing well, they're efficient. They find ways to score goals out of nothing. But I'm finding myself now thinking that away from home against these CONCACAF powers, that that's the threat they pose. That let yeah. the other team have the ball and quick yeah. bang, bang yeah. transition. Let's go with the, the pace. Nobody else has got that kind of pace in CONCACAF. Mexico are a better team than Canada, but they don't have that pace. They've got some really good players. They don't have that pace to be able to inject in the final third wheels. And there's something to be said there. Is there not that, you know... Maybe the biggest challenge now for Canada might be breaking down teams with a lower block against teams at home than teams like this on, on the road. What's yeah. been the criticism of the Canadian men's national team or the perceived weakness? That's a better point. They're defender. They're, they're defenders. Yeah. But the way they defend collectively uh, in that formation, going out to play on the counterattack, it suits them to a team. It actually complements the players that they have, the personnel that they actually have, better than going on in a game like Honduras that we saw on Thursday night, when you're, when you're taking the game to a team and, and, and they're backed up with, you know, essentially nine players behind the ball and a goalkeeper, Canada found it difficult to break them down over the course of 90 plus minutes. It, it's in a game like here. I just feel like they're much more comfortable. We saw it at the gold cup, Costa Rica, 
Mexico to top, top performances. That's how they played against the United States in 2019 at BMO Field as well. I think there's at times in the game where they can overrun an opponent and, and it causes some problems with their movement off the ball. I think it's really intelligent. It's very disciplined. But you're, you're absolutely right. And that's why, you know, th- again, this the U.S. national team should be the best team in this region right now. They were, they were the team on form, and you went away. And I know it might not be the difficult pitches of Honduras and El Salvador, but that's a tough game here tonight. Tough game, And to yeah. go on, and and really, the the, the, the chance that Pulisic hit off the post, okay, fair enough. But other than that, a self-inflicted wound on a goal, then a number of times where Canada tested Milan Borja. I mean, Canada defenders tested Milan Borja with efforts on target. That was about it tonight. Other than that, it was relatively comfortable. And I think if you're John Herman tonight, based upon what you were able to create on the counterattack, I think you can make the argument should have had two, three, four goals maybe. Like there were some real chances that I think Canada left on the table there coming out of this game. So, um, yeah, these away matches shouldn't scare Canada. Um, it'll be interesting to see if there's going to be fans in the stands because watching across one soccer, there's been empty stadiums or partially empty stadiums, which I think absolutely helps. Honduras is a full stadium, but – Jamaica wasn't, um, mm. you know, Costa Rica wasn't anywhere near capacity tonight. So that's something to monitor as well. And we'll see what things look like come October when you have two away matches. Yeah, it should be interesting. It's a, the other thing, Ollie, for me that struck me tonight was, you know, you know, and again, we'll get to Fonzie in a second, Alfonso Davies and, and Jonathan David and, and the, the star power that this team has. But I think the real, the real strength is the depth now. You know, you see someone like Mark Anthony K come in today. Scott Kennedy, okay, made a bit of a mistake, but it was a terrible throw in from Alfonso Davis. Other, other, other than that, very, very solid. Hoylet, again, comes in. He's a difference maker. You know, we've talked already about Adekubi. You know, these players that are coming in, and, and they're all going to be needed. Azorio's barely played. You know, Piet's not even mm-hmm. seen a pitch yeah. yet. You know, um, you know, no, no Cavallini. Um, these players that are coming in are all coming in at that high level. And again, we're showing there's not an immediate drop off where in the past, even not that long ago, Canada from take out the best 11, suddenly you would have seen a significant drop off right away. We're not seeing that. No, we're not. And, and I think Herdman deserves credit for that because I think, you know, not only has he done quite a good job of building this depth, I think over the past couple of years, but when he brings someone in like Adekubi, I think they always have a very clear role that suits the qualities they have, right? They're not just getting put into a team that is tactically very loose and, and not being asked to do a lot of different things. They're being plugged into very specific roles that suit their skill sets. And, and, and that's how you get the best out of individual players who may not be on the level of Davies and David and, and the real stars of this team, but can be very good role players. So I, I thought Kay was very good again tonight. He, he's one for me who has to be in the same conversation as, as a Tiba and Eustachio. I, I know there's a tendency to maybe look at the players in Europe and prefer them a little bit. But for me, Kay is one of those MLS players who is on that level. He's just not there yet in terms of physically being uh, in Europe. Um, kind of see the same thing with Matt Turner in golf for the US. Like one, one keeper's playing for Man City, one's playing for the New England Revolution, and it kind of sways your opinion a bit. Turn is clearly the best goalkeeper the US have. I, I think Kay is a similar kind of case in that he could very easily be at that level, he just hasn't got there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, thought he was excellent again tonight, and, and he's going to figure very prominently. And who, who the best two is, I think, is a real interesting question at this point. Great point on the depth as well by Ryan about Weatherspoon. Weatherspoon's not even seen a single minute yeah. either, and he's yeah. a quality player. You're right. He really is a really good player that they've got. Uh, a, a really good point. Uh, we're asking here as well, uh, if you could add one more player to the Canadian men's national team, de- declared or unclared, who would you add? Uh, who is the most underrated player today? Uh, put your comments in here. And we'll get to those as well. A reminder, Charlie O'Connor Clark will be in so- soon, our reporter uh, from the press conferences to let us know. Uh, I'm sure we know who the most happiest manager will be uh, talking about this. <laughs> John Herdman, Gareth, didn't have much to say uh, pregame uh, before this. He was, a quote was in enemy territory, didn't want to say much. In fact, I think, I don't know whether deliberately or not, they made it very difficult for him to even be seen on the, on the yes. pre-match press conference. Three or four, <laughs> three or four questions. They don't trust drones, drone attack. That's three or four was. questions yeah. out. Um, I have a feeling that he'd be more than willing to answer more than three or four questions tonight. Uh, Greg Berhalter might be the one who might want to uh, alter his f- fuzzy Zoom calls. Uh, but yeah, that, that was an interesting pre-match press conference. But yeah, lo- what about Alfonso? Because, you know, I think Kurt asked earlier, are we going to see him on Wednesday? We know John Herbin's been saying this. To ask players to play three games, 
by the way, is unprecedented. Uh, go all, go, by the way, go look across all, all the world right now. World Cup qualifiers across Europe. Teams are making 8, 9, 10, 11 changes. Teams are just not playing players three times. Now, that can be because they want to be smart. By, by the way, it can also be clubs telling them, do not play my player three times because they do have a lot of power in this. Uh, one, Wheels, were you surprised he played tonight? And two, what do you think, if he is fit, we should expect out of him on Wednesday night, Alfonso. I, I, I was expecting more rotation tonight, to be honest mm, with yeah. you. Uh, I know there were five changes. I thought it was going to be seven, maybe even even up to eight. That was, that was my yeah. expectation. Because, you know, let's not mince words. Wednesday fits the must-win category. If you're serious about going on and challenging, you need to beat El Salvador at home. And that's such a big game. You want to make sure that you're – your finest are fit and firing for that game. So Jonathan David lock him in to start that game. Tejon Buchanan, I, I, I think he's an automatic starter. I don't think Cavallini's at that level. I think he'll come off the bench. Um, Davies, if he can go, he will go. I, I don't think he came off injured. I think he ran his race. I thought he was absolutely exhausted. Do you know what he runs? He was doing up and up and down the line. And every time he was on the ball, it was Davies versus two or three. He did the exact same thing against Honduras and he was giving away the ball a little bit, but I think it was based on how he's being defended and isolated at times. But you saw like on the goal, if you play him into space, if he gets a step on you, you're absolute dead on arrival. You're like, you're done. He's past you and his head's up and he's looking for an option. If Canada can do something better, I think is having more options around Alfonso Davies. Ollie, I mean, we, we talked to Herman he was gushing about the way that Tejan Buchanan and Alfonso Davies were combining together uh, in the build-up yeah. to the Gold Cup before Alfonso Davies got hurt. I think he just needs a little bit more support, as good as Sam Akubi was. And that ball that, that that led to the goal was absolutely sensational because it hit him in stride. Davies didn't have to check back, check in, you know, hold up his run, KJ. It was just the perfect ball. But he's not the ideal attacking player that you'll need in a game against uh, against a team like El Salvador that can get up the wing and help Davies in those areas. So perhaps that's a game. It, it's not Lorea down the left. I'd like to see Tejon in that position. And he's going to start the game, KJ. And you're going to have to diversify your tack a little bit. So I think that might be a solution. I'm not too worried. I don't think that Alfonso Davies is hurt. I thought he was absolutely exhausted by the shift that he put in tonight and on Thursday against Honduras. I'll be happy to be wrong. I'll be shocked if he starts. I'll say that. Ollie? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. It, it, it feels like more of a left-back game for, for Davies, El Salvador. Um, and, and if you can, you know, this is a big if though, right? If you can manage the game and control the ball and spend most of the game in, in El Salvador's half and, you know, your, your counter press is good, so they're not really being able to build many attacks and Davies isn't having to make those long runs tracking back at left-back, then you can probably get through it, right? You can probably be okay, but you just don't know that the game is going to go that way in CONCACAF. So maybe it's one way you start without him. Things aren't going well, half time, on he comes. Um, I don't know. Or you could do it the other way around if you're really confident and give him 40, the first 45, try and get the game in a good place and then bring well, him off. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this though. There, there's three players on this Canadian team. If they're good to go, they're automatic starters for me. Alistair Johnston is like yeah. a key... Co like. He's the player that allows everything to happen in front. It, it, he makes it work. Stephen Eustachio yeah. in the middle of the park. If this guy's good to go, and he's, in, he's a marathon man. Like, mm -hmm. he played an insane number of games last season at club level. And at the end of this game, it, it looked like he was just as fresh as, it was, as he was in the first 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And Alfonso Davies. If Alfonso Davies is good to start, he had the, you know, the last 15, 20 minutes off here, perhaps he was just feeling a little bit winded. That, that's a decent place to be. He didn't play 180 minutes, 165. Okay, but I, like I agree. Uh, I he hope has you're to right. Play. I I, like, I hope you're Davies right. Is too good that you need to play him in a game that you must win at home field at BMO. Come on. I agree yeah. with everything you said, and I think I was just a little bit surprised to see him start today. Thinking about that, yeah, and Mazud, Ma Mazud makes Mazud makes a good point. Uh, take me, don't take me wrong. I am not underestimating El Salvador. They have just drawn nil nil no. with the United States and nil nil with Honduras. Okay, at home, uh, but they are not a team. No, no team in this in this region uh, should ever be taken lightly. This is this is this is a fight. You know, it's an octagon. Imagine them all in the, in, in the octagon. Okay, this is a, a real fight here. Uh, this is going to be tough. 
They're going to be a tough team to break down defensively. Um, my only point being is nothing to do with in- my point is is the team who pays him a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's my only point. 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 That's Karl Heinz yeah. Rummenigge. That's Bayern Munich. That's you name the guy yeah. over there who's watching KG, them out hey, of on this. That's they all have, I'm saying. Le- you know, they have Leipzig their first week, and then they have Champions I League, I believe, against Barcelona. I know the day and, after and, or the game after. And then you so. then you start to think about future windows, right? Like if, if Davies gets run very very hard in this one, what's what are Bayern going to be thinking about that? Maybe next time, if he has a slight niggle in his hamstring yeah. or something, they say he's not getting on the plane. Right? Come on, like, that's you know, you I, be, I, I don't buy that be at all. If, if they want to have a good relationship with one of their star players going forward, you're not going to say you're not going on international duty. Like Alfonso Davies is the present and part of the future. Of I get it, Wheels, Munich. but you love your right. right. Wheels, you love your Man United, and Sir Alex Ferguson did it for 20 years, mate. He didn't yeah. want his players yeah. playing for international football for 20 years. Julian Nagelsmann <laughs> is not Sir Alex Ferguson. <laughs> Christian Jack, come on now. Humberto <laughs> says Gareth Wheeler is a national treasure. How can you not well, disagree with that? Come very on. treasure. Uh, let's, all hope, let's all hope I'm wrong and Wheels is right, but I, I wouldn't be surprised I if we see so. Tejon Buchanan and Sam Adekubi lining up as fullbacks uh, in that game. But to Ollie's point, uh, the you one do. thing we do know... I think you're know, going four at the back. The one thing we do know, we do know this, is against teams that often are deeper, Alfonso Davies has been deployed more as a left back. And John Herman has said in the past, against teams who, who sit deeper, we want him coming on rather than receiving high the ball. And so maybe we do see something like that where, you know, he's not exerting as much energy and maybe he can play that position. Um so we'll see, uh, as I said. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting point to, to, to keep an eye on. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, Alistair Johnston, unstop, uh, you said undroppable. Oh, what a guy. What, what, what another great performance. I mean, he could have got a couple of yellow cards in there. And I hope he gives that referee a little bit of a, a shake of a hand tonight because he deserves it. <laughs> but, uh, a great performance on his home pitch again. Um, and I think that, it says I, I spoke to him this week on Beyond the Pitch, but it says a lot about Alistair's of, of evolution, Ali, that this guy is very comfortable. The moment we go to a four, fine. The moment we go back to a three, fine. And they are very different defining roles. It is not simply just moving another 10 yards further wide. It is who you pick up. It is developing the system. It is your four. It's the space between teammates. It's no longer just going man-to-man with Pulisic. And he did that and more again tonight. A player who had never played for Canada before 2021 and is now a player that is simply a player you have to start in a game. Yeah, I can't say enough good things about him, to be honest. Um, I think he's just been fantastic. And and that was why I liked the five tonight was because the US are always going to come forwards with five, right? The two fullbacks, the two inside forwards, the centre forwards. So you got to find a way to match up there. And and Johnston is the kind of the right centre back, if you like. He, he just stuck to Pulisic like glue, right? He did he did a brilliant job. Yes, okay, maybe was he a, a little bit lucky not to be booked earlier on, and that could have made his life more difficult. Sure, fine, but um, other than that, like I I just thought he did a, a near perfect job on on one of the best players in this region. And when you have a player like that who can match up against the best that uh, USA and Mexico have to offer, it's so so valuable. And then there was that moment this afternoon. I, I think I tweeted out the, the, the second half. It was 1 1, and Jonathan David and Tejon Buchanan are coming on the pitch. And mi- mind the way, Burholtz is looking down his bench and he's like, oh, I don't think we're going to bother putting anybody on here. We can't score. We've been playing with 10 men. You know, we've got a guy up front who can't get the ball. Oh, Josh Sargent, go on then. We'll throw you on. I mean, wheels. <laughs> this is real life right now. I know. Buchanan I, but, but and you, David. If you wanted any other reason uh, to put a nice bet on Norwich being relegated, they signed Josh Sargent. I, <laughs> I, I don't get it. I don't Poor understand. Norwich. I, I just wanted to mention when Canada was beating the U.S. 2-0 at BMO Field in 2019, Alistair Johnston was coming off a season playing for Vaughn Azuri in League, League One, One Ontario. Yeah. That shows you. And out there, it, it's not just his commitment, his superior tackling – his leadership. KJ, you chatted with him. I think he was having the same conversation with the referee tonight. He had the referee in his back pocket. Like he, he commands respect on the field. And and what you love about him is Canada loves to shift. And it, we, we, we talk a lot about formations, whether it's a five, whether it's a four, but when they attack, they send different players forward in different ways. Austin will either tuck or go, but he's always in the right position. When is he caught out? Like, if you're sending mm-hmm. Lorea forward and Davies forward and you're allowing the freedom to push fives and sixes on, 
you need players that are responsible across the back. And Johnston is the glue that keeps it together. Um, you know, Stevie alluded to it on the podcast, like, or on the broadcast. I don't know what his future has in store, but how can you not look at this player and be like, my God, what a gem. You're like, right. he's an yeah. absolute gem. Like, Herman told me when he came into camp. Like, he told me when Lorea came into camp for the first time, it changed things. But he said when Johnston came into camp, uh, he said, look, I have a gem on my head. And I don't think that people know how good this player is. And look at him now. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and Stevie, and we're talking about Stephen Colwell, who's on TSM broadcast, has been assistant manager on this team. He's got inside information here and he's used it, right? And, he, you, know, I, you know, you guys know me. I'm really good friends with Stevie. And mm. he said something in the pregame show that he and I have spoke about many times, but temperament, you know, like, a lot of times, players are born with a lot of talent, Ollie, and they don't always make it, right? Different things happen, attitude, laziness, money, inflation, popularity, lots of things go wrong, right? And life, this is a guy that you can easily, easily say right now, that's not going to happen to him. As ground as an individual as you could yeah. meet, right? It's still only 22, does every, works hard, trains hard, you know? Is there every every session a pure example of a professional, and that's why he's gonna that's why he's gonna go on to better things, Ollie. Yeah, I'm sure people have seen interviews he's done by now. Like he he could be the best analyst in the country if he wanted to already. Like he speaks so <laughs> he speaks so clearly about football. Well, and, you two and, are and, great. Come on, <laughs> well, I speak for, one of your I speak for myself. I don't want to write KJ off, but he's better than me for sure. Um, <laughs> But no, like yeah, like he's he's really impressive as an individual and, and not just as a player. And like talking about potentially going to Europe, Canada aren't the only team in the world who are doing what they do with their backline, where they switch between a five and a four very quickly. Is is something that is really picking up steam, I think. And Canada have probably seen you know in, in Europe and, and taking bits and pieces from teams yeah. all around the world and in, in kind of learning this system. And there'll there'll be a place for him. There'll be someone who will see you know what he can do in in that adaptable role, switching between different positions, and and they'll know the value of that. So I have no doubts that there'll be uh, there'll be a few suitors in for Alistair Johnston before too long. Talking about switching positions, being adaptable, potentially going to Europe. Ollie, I think you uh, you picked up your phone and decided to tweet about Richie Larea during the game. And at that moment, was, it, <laughs> was this one of those many moments during the game where you can basically play Canada bingo and tick the box that Richie Larea is getting mad and is is going after somebody? Yeah. Uh, ding, no, ding. Yeah. And, and, and what did you tweet something about? Oh, you'll have that every time. Take the yellow cards because, as I discussed with him on Beyond the Pitch this week. Uh, for a mild-mannered, very calm individual off the pitch, he's openly admitted it. He gets over that line, and he's got that look, and he, and he, he he's got that fire. And maybe that's a good thing for this Canada team because they've got they've got a lot of laid-back personalities, and you know, eleven choir boys don't win you many football matches. No, I, I personally love it. I love that he stands up for his teammates, gets in people's faces. You know, he doesn't take any bleep from from anyone. Like, I, I think it's fantastic, and I, and I think the thing with Larea. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, I like I I really like Cavallini as well. I'm just kind of a sucker for these kinds of players who show a bit of that edge and that grit. But the difference between the two is that Cavallini does things sometimes that are stupid, right? Like he gets himself suspended, he gets himself sent off at inopportune moments. Um, Richie Larea has never been sent off as a professional, right? I think he knows how to toe the line. He knows when to dial it back because he's on a yellow card or whatever. And he knows when to get involved and mix things up a bit. And I, I really like it personally. As I say, I just like those kinds of players generally, but I, I think it adds something to the team having that edge and, and, and that spine as well. It's nice having wind-up merchants in your team, right, Will? Exactly, exactly. Of course. Like, there's no backing <laughs> down. There's no intimidation. I, I like what's coming through here. My former, what's up, man? Uh, Daniil Henry brought the exact same swagger today. Johnny Brooks comes and pushes him behind. I love how he just turned around. I was like, bro, are you really going <laughs> to? Like he said, bro. And like, look, Henry's had a mistake in him. I think that he'd admit that over, you know, over yeah. the course of some of his career. Tonight, it was impeccable. Like, D Daniil Henry was an absolute beast at the back. He wasn't bullied. He wasn't. Um, intimidating and I think the, that you have to have a little bit of that coming into to, to this game like a little bit of glorious bastards to you right just like right. we're yep. not going to take crap from you we're going to push back Lorea, Henry, Johnston, Atakubi I mean they all brought it Kay in the middle of the park he was everywhere um, 
Hoylet's a player that that plays with that kind of attitude as well. And I think that that was purposeful, the way that John Herdman played, I mean, just in, in terms of his team selection, because he wanted guys that he could trust tonight and go out and do a job like that. I I am a wind-up merchant, yes, for a pickup song <laughs> game, but I don't believe that. I don't the legs anymore. I need to serve my purpose in the team. I don't believe that. I've only ever seen you play in charity events, usually run by myself, and you're usually quite mild-mannered wheels. Like you, because you know, those no the morning, merchant. I'm hungover, KJ. That's so probably what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Dunfield runs that's you pretty so close, to be fair. Uh, Danny Dunfield could be a wind-up merchant, I'm sure. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, no he's doubt he's about positive. it. He's positive. He's a positive coach. Can, can, oh, yeah. Can, can we, can we just talk about the goal that they, they, they conceded? Let's do it. Um, t- t- tonight for a moment, because you know, I think you both made the comment that um, Davies' throw was mistimed. Shouldn't have uh, put Scott Kennedy in a position like that. I think it was kind of like a twofold mistake. It was like a little bit of a mistake by Davies and a little bit of a mistake by Kennedy that contributed to what yeah. we threw, in. He threw, threw the, the ball to his right leg, too. By I the way. know he the did. Wrong, wrong. Exactly. It, it, Still, if Kennedy opened up his body and let that ball play, then he could have played it back to Borea and then you play it out. This is a player in Scott Kennedy that I still think we're figuring out what kind of player he is for the Kennedy men's national team. He looked very good over the course of the first round of qualifying. This is a step up in competition. I like him too. He's technically sound. Um, I, I think that he generally makes good decisions on the field. But when we talk about those alphas, those those aforementioned players that you can really trust right now. I think that Kennedy still is going to take him some time to adapt and evolve into that kind of player. And even though the giveaway and, and you know, it, it came off a Kennedy giveaway, there was still plenty of time to slip out that attack. A couple of missed challenges in the middle of the park. It came wide left. And then I was more upset, you know, it wasn't Kennedy losing that challenge where I actually think he picked up a knock. It was a lack of communication to tell Daniil Henry that he couldn't back get make his way back to defend Brendan Aronson. I think there was a lack of communication between the two defenders in that moment that left Milan Borian, who's been outstanding over the course of two games, uh, hanging out to dry a little bit. But I think that this is just something that if Kennedy was with this team for the Gold Cup, which he was not, his club would not release him. I think he'd be much more comfortable in situations like that. Whereas you know, Kamal Miller, I, I don't think he played his best game against Honduras. He is comfortable with these players and playing within the team concept. I just don't think that Kennedy's quite there yet. Um, but he is a very good player, and I think he can become that kind of player. I think that's fair. It, it was 13 seconds from the moment Alfonso Davies threw the ball to the moment the ball was in the back of the net. That's not ideal. One thing, I mean, look, look we're, we're giving a lot of praise to Canada tonight, as we should. But I think we need to understand, and this is not... <laughs> an amazing piece of analysis. Everybody knows it. That is their weak link. We know this is where the the least gifted amount of players are. They know that. John Herbert has publicly said that many times when he's tried to lower expectations. He's As he said, we do not have tier one, tier two level, as he would call them, defenders at that level. So we've had two games and we've had two mishaps and we've had two goals. And I think we have to understand, Ollie, that these are going to happen. And sometimes yeah. you're going to have to score two goals in a game. Now they have enough players to do that to win the majority of the games. Now against El Salvador, I think we're okay to have try and have an expectation that they can keep a clean sheet and maybe get a couple of goals. Maybe not. But I think we have to also understand, Ollie, that this team's going to have to show resilience and understand that there's going to be one, two, sometimes moments like that in yeah. games that, we, that they're going to have to find ways to either not make sure that they have a disaster and concede or just continue to move on and, and not get too intimidated by it. Is that fair? Yeah, it's a good point. And, it's, you know, Daniel Henry kind of exemplifies that, right? I, I, I thought in the uh, Gold Cup semi final, he had a really difficult first 15 minutes, which you can kind of understand because he hadn't been in the lineup throughout the tournament. But I, I thought for the most part after that, he did a really good job against a pretty good striker in Funes Mori. And I thought it was the same really? again tonight against against the US centre forward. So he can go through games and, you know, do a fantastic job on, on, on a big physical striker for 89 minutes. And then there's the moment, it wasn't necessarily him tonight, obviously it was more Kennedy and, and Davies and that breakdown there. But I think, I think he's one who kind of, you know, speaks for the, the back line as a whole. They can look very organized, very structured. Herdman's always going to have them in, you know, organized coming out of the blocks. Um, but there is an error in there. And, and that's something that you have to hope is not going to cost Canada too many points over the course of, of these 14 games. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, Charlie O'Connor Clark is on his way after the press conference. He'll be here very shortly to just let us know what was said uh, by John Herdman, Greg Berhalter, and others. Uh, we'll be interested to see that. 
Um, this week, El Salvador tickets still available. Wednesday, we'll all be there live. Oh, it's sold again. out now, buddy. Is sold it sold out? out? Oh, yeah, wow. they announced it. Oh, uh, excellent. I think they announced it during the game. Oh, right. Okay. There you Don't go. Good news. Me. So hopefully you have got your tickets already. Uh, we'll be there live on One Soccer and again on Sportsnet. Wheeler and uh, Terry will have the call. I'll be with Andy and Ollie on the sidelines. Uh, what to expect from El Salvador, uh, asked Steve on Wednesday. And uh, what do we think in terms of lineup for Canada as we as head towards that game? We've mentioned it earlier about some players who may not be there. We also alluded to it. Jonathan David's playing, right? He's starting that game. That's yeah. why he was given a break yeah. today. Probably Kyle Lahren will not be. Uh, based on that, I'd be surprised if he plays three games in a row. Uh, and I think it might be look better if just maybe play one of them uh, in, in a game like that. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. What, what what are you thinking, boys? You're thinking Boyan, Johnston, Vittoria back instead of Henry, maybe? Although I would say yeah. Daniil, I, I think Vittoria will come back. I'll say this about Daniil Henry. And I know we always talk about there's mistakes there. And that's probably the floor, right, Ollie? Um, and I think Vittoria could be a bit more solid. I think Daniil Henry has a higher ceiling than Stephen yeah. Vittoria. I, I I do. I, I I think that you know Vittoria can be be safe and steady, but I think Henry has an ability to really be a better defender sometimes in those situations. I don't know what you think, but I think Vittoria will probably come back for that game. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, I would think so. Um, I'm trying to think through this team here. I haven't even given Wednesday much thought yet, but yeah, yeah, D- David, uh, David's back in. I think it makes sense in a way to maybe just play with one striker and get a bit more creativity in the team. You know, you're going to be facing a team that defends very deep, makes it difficult for you. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I think Azorio is in contention with that being said. Um, Junior Hoyler has played quite a bit over two games, having come on at, at halftime against uh, Honduras. But he's the kind of player that I'd like to see in this game as well. Um, you really want to surround Jonathan David, I think, with as much creativity and as many chance creators as possible. Wheels, what do you think, mate? I wrote, many I wrote change? down my team. I wrote oh, down you my team. team as oh, there you go. Bought you some uh, time there. Nice. So, did you did you write down on paper or did you write down on that uh, whiteboard and, and marker that Kurt made sure you had for one soccer today no. this week? Oh, Adam, by the way, Adam Jack is <laughs> still overrated. Um, <laughs> I got more. I, I have a four, I don't know, three, three. Just make what sure it adds up to 10, mate. Like I know that. it's late. I got it. I got it. 11 KJ with the goalkeeper. Uh, Burian, oh, yeah, yeah. I have I have Johnson, Victoria, Miller, and I have Tejon Buchanan as my left back. Uh, I have a team in K in the middle of the park with the Zorio uh, joining them as a three-man midfield with Davies, David, and Laren. Wow. I think Laren goes. Laren came off. I, I honestly think the substitution of Kyle Laren was to preserve the player a little bit. Interesting. That's why I thought he came off. He, he scored a goal. Um, look, he's he scored in every World Cup qualifying match, um, bar the game against Serena. The guy is on absolute fire. He scored your two goals in the last two games. I have a difficult time keeping him out of the team. I, I, I just do. And I'd like to see him and Johnny David up top. And I think that this is a match that you can play, you know, take a little bit more risks. Much like Honduras, I think you're going to have a ton of possession. I think El Salvador is going to try to sit back, hold on, slow down the game. You're going to get all conca calf on you. That's how it's going to play out because they know that they're not the better team heading into this game. So I think you can play an attack-minded 11. The, the only, I think the only kind of decision for me is if K starts or maybe you just have a holding midfielder in there. It could be Eustachio. If he's healthy enough, if, if he wants to play, I play him. But maybe you have a holding defender uh, like Piet, to kind of nullify the counterattacks. Kennedy had a real problem uh, dealing with the counterattacks of Honduras. I think that's mm. a teachable moment that Kennedy needs that extra player in the midfield for this upcoming game because they see it playing out in a relatively similar way. But I kind of don't deviate from the game plan here. I kind of keep the same players that have kind of done well over these two games. I'd like to see Osorio play. I think he's really missed yeah. in games like that. Um uh, yeah, I think he should play. Anyway, he's, more he's of just, this. He's just not in. He's just not in great form right now, KJ. Like I understand what's going that. on at TFC. Like coming in, like I, you know, also I thought he played very well when he came on, and I agree with you. He provides the link between players. I'm just trying to justify maybe why he hasn't been on the field more. No, I think that's a decent. I, I think it's a decent observation. Um, 
By the way, we're going to get Charlie O'Connor clock in seconds uh, as he can give us the recap from the post-match press conferences. And here he is. Before there we get is. to Charlie, and here he is, hey guys. our outstanding report. I just want to say it's Sunday night in Canada. We're having over 2,000 views right now. We've got 563 people in the chat. Um, it's a pretty special night here, you know, as we re- as we just talk about Canadian soccer. I mean, uh, you know, just have a, that kind of discussion on a Sunday night with such an intelligent public. Um, Let's get uh, it, it, Let's, go. Awesome. Let's go. Let's go. Let's <laughs> go. This is pretty great to be able to do this. Uh, so, uh, Charlie, great to great to see you. Um, get your thoughts on the game in a second. But how was John Herdman? Uh, I don't know what kind of players we're talking after the game because we've been pretty busy. But what was the what was the mood like in the press conferences post match? Yeah, so we, we've kind of had to maybe pick up bits and pieces from John Herdman because uh, we actually didn't get to see him speak in this press conference. I, I think it was only in the room, but we've been able to, oh. to pick up bits and pieces from, from <laughs> Twitter and from, from his, his interview. He did an interview on Not TV lighting. after the game. Yeah. So what, but, I mean, what was he saying, Charlie? Yeah, so, so he, I mean, I think as you might expect, he's happier than Greg Berhalter, who <laughs> we, of course, did get to hear speak extensively. But... Uh, yeah, I, I think maybe not actually as happy as we might have expected because I think he really felt that the result was there for Canada in this game. Mm. And I think he said that, you know, even after Canada scored, they felt there was a lot of time on the clock and they could still find a couple more chances. And that's why, you know, he didn't really deviate from the plan in still bringing on Tejan Buchanan and, and Jonathan David after scoring. Um, so they, they still really felt it was there for them. But, you know, they acknowledged that obviously that's a really big point on the road. Um, and he felt that they looked a little bit more you know, comfortable today. He said they looked kind of rusty in that Honduras game, especially maybe in the early going a little bit. Um, and and he, he really felt that they started to maybe impose themselves more towards the end there. Uh, but yeah, overall, he's definitely, definitely happier than, than Greg Berhalter, but, you know, not necessarily as happy as maybe the rest of us are. How was, uh, how was Greg Berhalter, a man I find it very intriguing. I, I loved dealing with Greg when I worked at TSN, just a, just a great human being, a lovely guy. Um, but as you alluded to on our podcast, Charlie, when things aren't great, just has this ability to like stare mm-hmm. into your soul as he answers a question. <laughs> and I imagine, a Zoom. Yeah, and imagine yeah. right now he's getting some pelters uh, from a U.S. media who called this game a must win in their second match against the talented Canadian team. That's right. Many of them described it as a must win. It turned out to be a not win. Uh, so what was Greg Ber- Berhalter's overall ass- uh, assessment after this one? Yeah, it was a, a morose, uh, <laughs> I would say. Kind of, kind of, uh, kind of attitude there. The yeah, it was, um, roast for all of us idiots out here. A morose, or was it a roast of Greg Brown? Not. I well, to be honest, I think he he spoke for about you know eight questions, and I think four of them were about Weston McKinney. Okay. Um, yeah. and he he wasn't willing to take the bait on that. It's just there's a team policy that that McKinney uh, broke, and and that's as far as he would go. But yeah, he he was very disappointed with the result, and and just the. How, how the U.S. was moving the ball, he felt like they really, you know, they obviously had a lot of possession in this game, but he was very complimentary of Canada in saying that they were really difficult to break down. And and he felt that, you know, the U.S., when they were a little bit hesitant to put balls in, it gave Canada these opportunities to shift the back line and things. So he talked a bit about the kinds of adjustments they tried to make. They tried to play balls in from the fullbacks directly to the striker to maybe bypass some of that space. Um, but it didn't necessarily come yeah, off, I did. think. Did they have a striker on the pitch? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's it. I mean, I, I think they did have a striker on the pitch. He was more interested in uh, sliding two feet into tackles. I, than, I refuse uh, to, to, to – I, I refuse – I, I know Luke Wildman is a pro's pro. I refuse to acknowledge that you pronounce his name P-fuck. Like, there's no chance <laughs> you pronounce his name. There is 0% <laughs> chance. I, I don't know what the proper pronunciation is, but that can't be it. Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, but I think – because Burhalter was a lot more complimentary of Canada than I know – I think Brandon Aronson is in some hot water at the moment because his TV interview, he said uh, he said that, that Canada just didn't want to play in this game. They just wanted to sit back, oh. which I think is a little harsh. Wow. <laughs> Give me a break, Brandon. Interesting. <laughs> wow. Yeah, which is... He's come with know, the old Jose like Mourinho Austria. line. Only yeah, bold he wants to play. player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. He was... Uh, Christian Pulisic, who is a, a more experienced player, I think at this point, was also complimentary of Canada. He just talked okay. about how tough Canada really was for them to break down because they seem to, he said that they seem to maybe run out of ideas against this Canada defending and maybe Canada 
had more ideas. I obviously changed things a lot more often than the U.S. did, and I know that I know that Berhalt is getting a lot of criticism for not making substitutions and not changing things up much. But you know, I did. I, I'm not really sure what exactly they could have done because mm -hmm. um, they they do seem very frustrated. Well, imagine being the United States right now, just for a second. I know we don't care to be, but they've just played. <laughs> they've just been played. They've just played two games against two teams they don't believe is going to make the World Cup, and they haven't mm -hmm. beaten either of them. Yeah. Canada has just played two games where both teams, we could make legitimate arguments, are contenders to make the World Cup and have drawn both games. That's the yeah. difference here, right? Like, I know the Honduras game was a disappointment, wow. but that's a bit of a, that, that is a big difference, Wheels. I know they've only got two points. I know. But in the strength of scheduling right now, I think Canada would, would say that they're happier with the two that what they've got than the U.S. Your thoughts, Wheels? On one, on one soccer today on Thursday, I told all the, the U.S. men's national team, overrated and already you have what? fan base questioning the manager you called them the yeah, best team in the region wheels no, but I <laughs> you still think they're overrated I you, still you said underrated you're rating them higher than anybody else <laughs> anyways forget about that comment <laughs> I will say this they have a manager that's being criticized you, right but now for making a triple change in the 83rd minute yeah they have right. Weston McKinney who put himself before the team this isn't the first time this has happened at Juventus as well KJ Right. That's a real problem. Gio Reyna injured. Is he going to play against Honduras? Another top, top player. He's done. It and sounds like Daryl he's not. DK, he's going back the, the to Germany, yeah. Gio so Reyna's done. The, he's done, yeah. The $20 million man, Daryl DK, is coming back. <laughs> he isn't. He's coming back from injury. <laughs> Zach Steffen is COVID. It's just about ev just about everything that's gone wrong for the U.S. men. men now. So Junior Desk picked wrong. up an injury there, too. Yeah, that's got her. That's great yeah. point. And great now point. they go to Honduras, a difficult place to play where they had trouble keeping electricity in the stadium tonight. So, And their record I mean, away from home, the U.S., by the way, their record, go, go look it up, is not bad. It's atrocious in World Cup qualifying. <laughs> that's why they yeah. didn't make it in, 2000 and, in, in 2018. Yeah. Their, their record away from home against competitive teams in this region is terrible. So, yeah, you're right. They, 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 are, they, are, uh, they should be panicking a little bit here, Ollie. I know you want to, that's something to say there about that. Yeah, I, Sorry, I just wanted Ollie, to add. We're, we're trying to free under the bus. That's my bad. <laughs> that's okay. I forgive you. It's not the first time. won't be the last. <laughs> um, no, I, I just wanted to say on the US, like I know what they did in the summer kind of erased this a little bit and, and maybe rightly so. But for me, there's still this contradiction here between Greg Berhalter, who wants to play a very controlled possession oriented style. We saw that again tonight. And then a team of players and particularly the European players who weren't there at the Gold Cup. When you think of Adams, Aronson, um, Pulisic, Reyna, who are at their best in transition. Right, mm -hmm. they've got a ton of energy, a ton of pace, and you see how they scored the goal tonight. It's a turnover, transition, bang. They can be absolutely lethal in those situations. And for me, the way the two, you know, the group of players and the coach, I think Berhalter is a really good coach. I'm just not sure they really mesh together in, in the right way. Um, so, you know, watching that tonight, I, I think there's going to be other teams in this region thinking when we go to the States, if we can do what Canada do and present a pretty organized and solid defensive front, I'm not sure if they're going to have the answers. Yeah, it's a really good point, Ollie, and that's why the U.S. were very good against Mexico. That's why they come alive against Mexico yeah. because they're happy for Mexico to have the ball and then dig deep and then really. I mean, obviously the McKenney goal in the in the Nations League, the header from a set piece was different, but that drove them on to make a big difference in, in extra time. Um, we're past an hour. We've done well here, boys. Charlie, we really? um, I want to say you've been a massive fan of this team for a long time. And I know you're in the crowd on 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 Wednesday night. You'll be there it's on Thursday night. You'll be there for me on Wednesday night in the press box at BMO Field. But your overall take on this performance by Canada tonight and how far they've come? Yeah, they've definitely come a very long way. And I think sometimes in in recent versions of the Canadian national team, they could maybe hang in there for a while in a game like this. But if they concede, you might start to see the wind come out of the sails a little bit. But for them to, you know, pick it back up and score, I think seven minutes after conceding in the second half, it shows that there's there is a little bit of a different edge to this team, right? They're, who are trying to to maybe grow into games and and just show a lot of different kinds of qualities against these teams. I mean, I think it's a bit of a, a psychological edge against a team like the U.S. when you do change things up so much against them, right? Um, and it's just they're 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 a lot more complex than they've been. In, in recent mm. editions or we recent attempts to qualify for the World Cup. And obviously the 
quality. I think it goes without saying that, you know, these are the most talented players that Canada has had in a very long time. Um, but over it, it really does feel like, you know, they deserve to be here, right? And there's no team that they're going to come up against where you know, they'll be played off the park. Great point. And, you know, we've heard many times about how the past, uh, the teams tried to do what they could, stay in games, and then they couldn't do it. And here we are now in a summer where, where they went down a goal to nil to the United States in the Gold Cup. And then for the majority of the game, didn't get the goal, but outplayed them. Went down a goal against Mexico and Buchanan equalized and got them back in that game. And it took a 99th minute gut check goal uh, to win that game. And then here they are tonight, down a goal and again, come back fighting wheels like this is a team this is a this is a group in the past no disrespect to players but when they went behind against these teams in the past they were down on the canvas mate they weren't getting back up yeah they uh they believe <laughs> simply put like they believe uh that they should go on and not just be there but go on and win uh i, I was told I, I don't even remember saying half the things that i say in commentary but after um after the that, Costa Rica that, game, that in there, I, I went on like, they believe, you believe. <laughs> like I was, it was kind of like a little bit of a rocky thing. I don't know where it came from. But uh, I think that they use that internally because they look around the room and, and they believe. Milan Morian, I'm, I'm not sure. You guys went on with the post-match show and we just kind of like had the feed from the field after Thursday night. And Borian had the entire team in the huddle, and we picked mm. up his microphone, and he was preaching the exact same thing. Like, we know we're stronger, we know we're better. We need to go on and step this up. And it's like, you know, there's leaders in this group, and I, I, I think that they look around and they trust themselves implicitly. I, you know, I've had someone message me, "This isn't like your grandfather's Canadian team. It's not my father's no. Canadian men's national team. It's not your team. older it's brothers just, either." No, no, exactly. If I had an older brother, it wouldn't be his team. So th this is this is something this is something completely different. Now, I think the emotions ran a little bit too high on um, on Thursday night. It's I fair. think that the mentality when you're expected to go on and win, and you know it was their first time back at home playing in front of home yeah. fans in almost two years. I think that that kind of led to a little bit of a slower start, but. Now they're used to it. They've been there, done that before. That's why I'm expecting a completely different performance here on uh, on, on Wednesday night. And what we saw in all of these competitions and all of these windows over the course of this year, when Canada's played games, they've got better each game that they played. So I'm expecting, you know, best one for the final one here in the group stage. Last one for me, and I'll get you guys window. to comment on this. But this is why before they got to this, when we were doing the games this summer in one soccer, the World Cup, the World Cup prelims, Haiti, Aruba, Suriname. Yeah. Why they said they had to get to moments like this, right? All of you and I sat next to each other. Humi was there. And it's why I've preached all along that the journey is almost more important than the destination. Yes, Qatar 2022. Well, if we get there, give us time. We'll talk about it for a long time. We'll be unbelievable, okay? It'll be amazing to talk about Canada. Yet. But this journey right now, I don't know about you guys. I'm sure we're all involved in, this, in the game. I'm getting messages from casual fans seeing a game, asking about this team. It is a fun team, players that are likable, relatable. They can see things from these teams that they like, that they enjoy. It is not a team sitting deep and trying to get something out of it. There's a plodding along or what's this soccer thing. It is easy to find the, the things to like about this team as well. Um, and this is what I'm saying. The journey is bringing people on every time, Ollie, is almost as important as getting there. Yeah, like they've played... What five of the what most people would say is the top six in Concacaf, or four of the top six in Concacaf, aside from Jamaica since the Gold Cup. Um, now they've only won one of those games. So you can say on the surface the record doesn't look great, but they've been in it every single game, mm. right? And and at times they deserved more than they've got in games, and you know lost to the US in the Gold Cup, lost to Mexico when they deserved more, but they're in every game, and and they they, they give you a real honest effort in every single game. So when when you look at you know just the two games we've had already what being at BMO Field was like last week and, and the atmosphere there and that occasion. It was so good. You look at, oh. It was fantastic. And you look at how many people tonight are going to see that Alfonso Davies highlight of, of the goal. Um, like yeah. we're already producing these moments that a lot of people are going to take notice of, a lot of people are going to remember. And, and that's what builds your program and, and takes, it to, takes it to a place that I don't think we've seen it go before. Yeah, I agree. It's fun times, right? Charlie, it's pretty special. Yeah, it's the exact same. I mean, I've got friends that will watch maybe 
three soccer games a year. They watch the Champions League final and if there's an international tournament, but they've they're texting me asking me who Tejon Buchanan is, mm. right? Like it, <laughs> it is it is actually it's happening, and, and I think it's a bit of like you you can talk about it in cliches and and so on, and and maybe we can. It, it sounds like it's it's an exaggeration, but it really is happening that people are taking notice of this team and. You know, it's it's really a special generation of players that deserve to be recognized and and to be seen by by this country, and it, it's happening. It really is happening. Early, early I, I appreciate your non soccer friends are watching big soccer games that are not on TV. Wheels, last word from you. Uh, you know, you're an, um, an unbelievable sports fan, and you do so many other things with sports in the past. You know, there's only one guy on this out of the four of us who can hold a three or four hour radio show in the city of Toronto tomorrow if we if we needed to. Stop talking, <laughs> point blood. being, listen, my point being is away from soccer, this is a team that is relatable, right? This is what I'm saying is a likable team. And this is what will, will, I mean, it isn't vital that we get new fans. I've never thought it has been. I think more now about the fans like Charlie, like many people I've known that's followed this team for 20, 30, 40 years. They deserve this moment more than anybody else who's willing to come on. We'll welcome anybody. Uh, but this is, this is a, this is what I'm saying about this group is that the way that they play, like Ollie said, Davies goal tonight, that will attract more fans that way. Won't it? Hope so. I, I hope so. I, I find that the people that are being the hardest on the team and the program and, and everything to do with the production that is are the hardcore fans, which I hope that people can actually sit back and start looking at things like, yeah, this is pretty good, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> this is pretty special. That's why I included my intro uh, to the game on Thursday. And I said for those longtime fans that have been there, you know, through a lot of difficult times, Thank you for standing by the team and go on and enjoy this. Like th this is for you. Uh, 14 games played at the highest level in this region. Get excited about it and get ready for the roller coaster ride. And I also said, if you're brand new to this, if you're a completely new fan, welcome. It it's no judgment. Welcome aboard. Come on in. Get to know these players. Start to understand what makes so many other people so excited about this group. And I've told Ken Soccer this. This is what your marketing campaign should be. People would listen to me, maybe, whatever. But, like, <laughs> welcome aboard. Welcome home. You know, like, it's time that we throw that door open and become absolutely inclusive to everyone that wants to, to, to jump on this wild ride that's going to play out between now and March. It, it, it's going to be phenomenal. And hopefully it carries on through the summer months all the way to next, you know, next winter in Qatar. Um, that's, but that's, um, so. th that, 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 that's, that's the thing. So whether you're hardcore, whether it's the person that watched the game tonight, has the most rudimentary, rudimentary take, that's fine. Like, this is what it's all about, just learning, growing, and most importantly, cheering together and backing this team. Yeah, backing the team, no doubt about it, and love for the sport, right? I have to say, I'm, I'm yeah. humbled by the response tonight. We came up with this idea this week to come up with this. Um, you know, we're just a, you know, just a bunch of guys on a Sunday night talking about a match. The response, the amount of comments and questions we've got has been absolutely fantastic. The views we've got on a Sunday night, it shows Canada cares. Uh, shout mm -hmm. out to Jack, shout out to Jack Murray TV. Great to see you in here as well. Uh, many of you guys, but it's awesome. It's fantastic. It's just, it, this is the culture we want to build, right? Um, for more of this, by the way, catch one soccer today, Ollie and wheels and Andy do a brilliant job twice a week. They'll be on, on Tuesday this week, right boys? Not holiday Monday. weekend. Yeah, yeah. Holiday weekend, Tuesday, Ollie and I will have our CPL team of the week. I uh, will continue to recap, Ooh. recap what has been a brilliant week. Always in the Always controversial. Just ask the players. Um, uh, Charlie, <laughs> Charlie and I will be doing that. And uh, we're talking about that this week as well as we get uh, with my team with Marty, Benedict and Brady and continue to break down all the things in the Canadian Premier League. What a season we're having there as we get through the midway point of that as well. And we will be back on Wednesday live from BMO Field. Uh, it doesn't get much better than that, boys. Uh, it's going to be a pretty special night again. We hope to see many of you there. Sellout crowd. Uh, what a special moment that is to say. A sellout crowd at BMO Field. 
We'll see you then as well for that. In the meantime, Charlie, thanks for this. Great to have you on. Great job as always. And you can read Charlie's brilliant work at campl.ca. Wheels, where would we be without you, mate? Thanks so much for everything you do for Canada Soccer for tonight as well. And Ollie, always a pleasure, mate. Thanks for your brain and your insights. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you for everyone for joining us. Uh, we got a point. Canada got a point. It carries on. The journey carries on. And if you missed any of this show, you can listen or watch any of it. Use the same link. We will put out the link later. And you can watch one hour and 12 minutes of, what, of US 1, Canada Ow. 1, the recap podcast and podcast. Uh, good night, everybody, and thanks again for watching. God bless. Take care. Oh, Canada, baby.